so where I want you to start with was, so this is the lecture I usually give at the beginning-ish of the um, electrostatics coverage. So we start out with some more intuitive uh, coverage of electrostatics because one of the advantages uh, when we are covering um, electrostatics is that it's a, it's a phenomenon that is quite familiar to a lot of people because um, you have seen things electrostatically attract. And in an in-person lecture, I would have some nice demos with the comb and torn off pieces of paper. I think maybe the best version of that I can do on a desktop is with a simulation, mostly to remind you of experiences you might have had. And some of the features of that experience that sometimes unless you are paying close attention to detail, it's easy to not notice. So this is a simple demo that illustrates the conceptual ideas of uh, static electricity. So it has these illustrations of the charges that are present in all materials. The positive charges are protons, negative charges are electrons. Electrons can move around more freely than protons. Um, oftentimes, our usual interaction with the electrostatics will be more like this. Like when you look at an object, you don't often see immediately if it has charges or not. And the default state of things is not to have any electrical interaction. And But under certain circumstances, maybe you have a balloon that you rub on a sweater, then it behaves as if uh, it has some special property. And uh, I guess the more real life like a version would be this one showing no charges. But as you do experiments, you can figure out, hmm, something's different about this balloon. I think it, it it's attracted to this sweater when it's close enough. And it could be made to attract, be attracted to the wall. And, uh, I, and I can remove the wall. Um, and, and this simulation is showing uh, our uh, current and correct <laughs> understanding of how this happens. All uh, matter, all normal matter contains charges, positive and negative charges, protons and electrons. And um, when you are rubbing things, some of those electrons transfer and that results in a net charge on the balloon and the sweater. And um, as you look at this interaction, there are some interesting things to see. So I think there's a, some right place I can place this balloon so that it kind of hangs in the middle and doesn't move anywhere. Uh, or, I don't know, it's a kind of hard. When it's close to the wall, somehow it's attracted to the wall. I think that part needs a little more explanation. Um, but this part is a bit easier, uh, how the balloon is attracted to the positively charged the sweater. When I let go of the balloon here, it gets pulled in. Now, if you look at how quickly it's pulled in, you will see that there is a bit of a difference in how quickly the balloon accelerates, depending on how close to the other charges I release it. And, and when you look at the balloon and the wall, you see that as I move the negatively charged the balloon closer to the wall, something does happen to the charges on the wall the negative charges are pushed away. And, and what this is trying to show is a phenomenon called the polarization. And that is how the balloon is attracted to the wall. The polarization orients these dipoles in such a way that um, the, the dipoles and these negative charges attract. Now, what I want to pay, want you to pay attention to as you look at this is how all these phenomena, they depend on distance. So the, kind of repulsion you see this between these negative charges and these negative charges it depends on distance when the balloon is far away those negative charges act as though um, nothing's happening but as you move this closer in that's when those negative charges are pushed away and so there's a um, some kind of a distance dependence on the electrostatic forces and this is the sort of thing that um, that um, you really only figure out uh, what's going on through experiment. So the law that we are going to write down, it, uh, um, it's the distillation of that experiment done by other people hundreds of, of years ago. And um, in this class, we, uh, we call that law Coulomb's law. 
And it's one of those things that can't be derived. You have to, um, <laughs> you just have to know it, or you have to figure out, figure it out through experiments. And once you figure it out, then the form of Coulomb's law. Let me just write down the final form, uh, which will look like this: the electrostatic or electric force is given by some constant times the product of charges. Q1 times Q2. For some reason, we use the letter Q for charges. I don't think I ever got the explanation why. Divided by distance squared. And for distance, for some reason, we use the letter R. Um, and it's a vector quantity. I need a way to indicate direction, and that should be R hat. So this is Coulomb's law. In one single line, it contains quite a bit of information about electricity. The biggest thing would be that this is an inverse square law. It makes it so that the strength of the electric force is weaker for objects that are farther apart. And it's stronger for objects that are closer together. And so that's the inverse, that's the consequence of the inverse square law. When R is uh, small, the force is great. When R is large, the force is small. And you have actually seen a, an inverse square law before. In physics 4a, you have seen the, gravi the gravitational force, not the mg version, that's the approximate version that's uh, usable when you are near the surface of the Earth. For the more general expression, universal law of gravitation, you have seen this. g times product of masses divided by distance squared. And in terms of mathematical form, electrostatic force, Coulomb's law is very similar to the, the Newton's law of universal gravitation. They are both, both the inverse square laws and they are, they are both conservative and, and so on. So, so that's the first piece of information that's embedded in this one line of equation telling you about Coulomb's law. It tells you the other stuff as well that you might have guessed, even if no one told you, that it um, depends on the, um, the strength of this force, depends on the magnitude of the pair of charges that are interacting. So if you have two charges that, um, if even one of them has no charge, then there's no force between them. For there to be electric force between them, they both need to have some charge. And when you make one charge larger than the, even though, even if the other charge is still at the same size, the strength of interaction will become larger because that's where, that's what this strength of the interaction depending on the product of charges mean. Um, let's see, what other information can you tell from here? Uh, there's one piece of uh, thing that, um, beginning physics students need um, a lot of reminders with to be trained into checking and uh, and to notice it when you are not seeing it. So it's the unit. When you look at the unit, you see that force is in the unit of Newton. And the right hand side is tricky. Um, you have different units. So you have a unit of one over meter squared, uh, the distance squared. And for the charges, you will just have to know that we have a new unit of charge called Coulomb. It's technically not strictly necessary, but we work with the SI system, which has chosen to introduce this unit of charge. So uh, the numerator there is Coulomb squared. And when you compare this left-hand side to the right-hand side, is hopefully where you see um, they are not the same units. So this equality doesn't work. Um, I want to say the force is equal to something and it cannot be equal to just to this because units don't match. And that's where the Coulomb constant comes in. Um, this is a constant, fairly large. I don't have it memorized, but I know it's fairly large. And this comes in the correct units necessary so that the units all match up. So this must have unit of Newton times meters squared per coulomb squared. 
And in this unit, uh, the Coulomb constant is pretty large. It's like, I don't know, nine times 10 to the power of nine, or I don't, I don't have it memorized. I'll eventually have to look it up when I plug in numbers. So, so Coulomb's law also gives you that. So um, one, I guess one way to say it is the Coulomb's law gives you the unit of the Coulomb constant, because this is the only set of SI units that will work out for this equality to hold. So now what I want you to spend a little bit of time talking about is this um, vector stuff. I think, um, <laughs> so I have to fess up a little bit of a bad habit of uh, physicists and possibly mathematicians, I don't know. I only speak for physicists in me. Um, we tend not to repeat stuff. <laughs> I think uh, a lot of times our assumption is that we say something once and that's enough because <laughs> repetition should, is redundant. <laughs> you kind of see it in the structure of how we structure physics as a course content. We don't, we are not in the habit of making redundant, unnecessary, a duplicative list of laws. Um, when you, it, you know, we, it's the fundamental science and part of something being fundamental means you need as few of these things as possible. Um, so, so in the past, when I teach physics 4B, I used to not review any vector stuff. <laughs> I, my assumption was, hey, to get here, you should have taken physics 4A. Physics 4A covers vectors, so you ought to know what the vectors are. Um, but when we were doing thermodynamics, we didn't really talk, we didn't have to talk a lot about uh, direct uh, quantities with the direction, so vectors. So we didn't have to do that for thermodynamics. So I think as we are getting into electricity and magnetism, which probably of all the physics content that you have seen and you will see, um, is most directly related to uh, the vectors in terms of mathematical operations and in terms of everything. So I think uh, uh, this point in the semester is the right time to do a little bit of review. Um, so let me just uh, start out with uh, some visual reminder of what these um, arrows you see in the Coulomb's law, how they, um, how they match up with something graphical. So let me talk about, for example, let, let's just draw um, example of uh, charges. So let's say I have a charge here, Q1, and I have another charge here, Q2. And I think most people can uh, uh, draw, um, have a graphical connection uh, with these charges in space. So, um, so you might say, all right, uh, these two charges, they are some distance d apart. And um, I, I guess that's it. <laughs> and, and if we weren't concerned with the vector stuff, we might say, okay, so the strength of force between these two charges is uh, Coulomb constant times the product of two charges divided by distance squared. And, um, oh, and if these are both positive, for example, then the force is repulsive. Uh, likes repel and opposites attract. Um, it's a feature of Coulomb's law. Now, I want to see a, show you a more formal description that takes into account that force is a vector quantity. It has a sense of direction, and it's a sense of direction matters often. So the starting place is to define a displacement vector. I think I'm calling you back to probably what might have been covered in your, I want to say trigonometry class. It might have been geometry class, um, or it could have been physics 4A. <laughs> so if you imagine uh, having some space, and let me just draw x, y coordinates so that I have some easy way of referring to points. This is something you do learn in uh, either geometry or algebra to uh, kind of the marriage of um, algebra and ge geometry as introduction of the Cartesian coordinate system. And with the coordinate system, you can 
um, refer to this point as uh, with these coordinates. And um, vector is a mathematical object that lives in this background. And the most intuitive representation of the vector we use is this one, one that goes from origin to a point that illustrates the length of the vector and the direction that the vector goes in. And one of the most common letters we use for vectors like this is R. Don't really know why. Maybe for radius, uh, if imagining this is part of a circle or something, but R is a common letter. And when we have R with an arrow on top, then we are emphasizing it's a, a real a vector quantity with the direction and everything. So one way to represent this R vector might be in the unit vector notation. You could write this as the vector component x naught and y naught. And, um, and I'd like to represent this like algebraically, like it's these two things added together. And if I'm simply adding two numbers together, this doesn't do what I want it to do. It doesn't represent a direction. And this is where we introduce the idea of unit vector. Um, we should have done it in physics 4A. The unit vector, for example, x hat, which other textbooks might call i hat, they all refer to the same thing. It's a vector of unit length. The length here is one with no other units or like meters or it's just one. Uh, it's a vector of unit length, vector of length one that points in the direction of positive x direction. And there's also y unit vector, y hat, or different textbooks might use j hat. Um, I prefer y hat. So this is the other unit vector that points in the y direction, plus y direction. And um, we represented this R vector as um, the scalar x naught, the component, times x hat. So that uh, version of the vector would uh, have this length. So this would uh, be x naught times x hat. So x hat scaled up to this length, uh, plus y naught times y hat. So that would represent uh, this vector, y hat scaled up to the length of y naught, y naught, y hat. And in fact, if you remember the head to tail addition stuff for vectors, then you can see how by adding this vector and this vector, you can get your r vector. You can see graphically here, add these two vectors, you get the r vector. So this is vectors. Now hopefully all this is ringing a bell. You feel like you have seen it before. And now let me do something that um, to more of what we'll be doing this semester, which is that uh, we are going to generalize and we are going to use this notation in more context. And we are going to use it in a way that it helps reduce uh, tedious writing. Um, so these charges, I deliberately drew them um, in a kind of tilted way because um, if I just drew them horizontally or vertically, then they would fit nicely into one of these axes and I didn't have to do anything extra. So now that they are in some arbitrary rotation so that I can have some um, something that's uh, meant to be generally applicable. Let me draw a couple more diagrams or a couple more auxiliary figures. One is the definition of this uh, R vector. So how we define this R vector, let's say we are looking at this uh, charge Q2 and we are considering the electric force on charge two by charge one then the r vector that uh, we have in mind is the vector that goes from the the source charge the charge that's exerting force and goes like an arrow and ends at the charge that's feeling the force this is my r vector um, and and as you look at this expression that's here you don't see any R with arrow on top. 
you don't see this. So I need a little bit of uh, expansion of that. Um, this R vector, we can break it into two parts, basically. One part that has the magnitude that tells you how long it is. And the other part that only tells you the direction. And that's what these two pieces are. So I have the, I can write this vector this way. The, the magnitude R, this is a scalar, not a vector. It just indicates the length of the R vector times the unit vector r hat and this r hat is unit vector like the x hat and y hat before so the thing to know is that it has length of one and what's special about this r hat is that it's a vector that points along r it's a kind of a common convention so if you have a unit vector that's a pointing in the same direction as one of the vectors then we call that vector's name and the hat so this is how Coulomb's law is described. Here you can actually see all the how Coulomb's law includes um, this uh, one single expression. It includes all the information you needed to know about um, electric interaction. The whole thing about you know like so, repel opposite attract. You don't need to remember that separately from Coulomb's law. Watch. Considering this charge Q2, if I have charges Q1 and Q2, if they are both positive, then I should have an electric force that points in the direction of R hat. All these coefficients are positive. So uh, when you uh, when you when you indicate a force on Q2 that looks like that, then that. Uh, in the direction that's repulsive, uh, that's away from Q1. And what if, if you uh, change, consider, change what charge you are considering? If you change to looking at Q1, then remember how we define the vector R. It's the vector from the source charge to the target charge. Um, or before, when we are considering the force on to this R vector went from one to two. And now as we are considering force on Q1, uh, force on one by two. Well, so it, it this, uh, this other second R vector, it'll be originating from uh, Q2 and then pointing towards Q1. And this would be my new unit vector for uh, not R2, uh, let me label it as R um, on 1 by 2. So when you work out the force, the force uh, goes in the same direction as this R hat vector. So it goes in this direction. That's also repulsive. Now, imagine if uh, both of these charges were negative. That actually, that possibility is already covered here. If both charges are negative, then their product is positive. So, so none of these directions change. They remain at the same direction. I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> I don't have to do anything. Now watch what happens if one of the charges is positive. If, for example, Q1 is positive and Q2 is negative, then as you look at here, you see, okay, so this coefficient is now going to be negative. That means the direction of force is opposite of the unit vector. So if you are looking at force on Q2, and again, this is the unit vector for on two by one, well, force vector, it goes in the opposite direction. So the electric force vector now has to point this way. And on two by one. And, and this is exactly the attractive force that you might expect from uh, opposites attract. But you don't actually have to memorize that as a separate statement or anything. This uh, one mathematical expression contains all of that. Um, and what other amazing things can I say about that uh, expression? Well, um, I guess maybe I'll leave that there. Um, uh, other than to note, so so this vector spot stuff again, it's something that we are beginning to cover, uh, begin to use uh, 
more extensively now that we are studying on electricity and magnetism. And I remember looking through our textbook before that it didn't quite explicitly review vectors um, because, uh, you know, the people who wrote this textbook, they are also physicists. So they are not in habit of repeating themselves. <laughs> so as they talk about electric forces and Coulomb's law, they will just to uh, um, use this uh, vector notation without any additional elaboration or discussion or anything. Like this is a wonderful formula and um, they won't explain to you what uh, this notation means. Um, so let me point you to the place. If uh, this looks familiar, then great. Uh, you're doing wonderfully. In case it's not, let me show you where you can review. And I do strongly encourage that people review now before um, before you go farther into electricity and magnetism. The place where you can review this is in volume one. This is the first semester material. This covers the physics 4A material. And it's one of the first two chapters that covers vectors. In fact, it's an entire chapter chapter two, Vectors, in University Physics of Volume 1. And I guess my recommendation, if someone were coming to me uh, telling me, oh, I don't really remember vectors, what do I do? I just say, hey, read this chapter. Uh, it's not that long of a chapter, and it covers everything you need to know about vectors, you know, scalar vector distinction that you spend a lot of time talking about in <laughs> Physics 4A, and all the different vector notation stuff, the arrow on top, and uh, vector terminology like magnitude. And does it cover unit vector? It might not cover unit vector notation quite explicitly yet, let me. Oh, I guess it it is a long chapter, but it covers all these vector properties that are good to know. Um, and yeah, so, ah, here it is, unit vector. So, um, so this the you the one common thing about unit vectors that it has a head on top. That's how we indicate unit vectors. Uh, here, I guess they didn't use the same letter as the. Uh, depending on context, the different letter will be popular for use with the unit vectors. But the concept of unit vectors is important, and it's introduced here. And um, yeah, and algebra of vectors, head to tail method. Hopefully, you've seen all that. If not, this is the thing to review. Um, and, um, wait, where's my next button? <laughs> and what I wanted to show and talk about was, so coordinate systems, I do, uh, think you should uh, be familiar with it. And to the extent that this doesn't look quite as familiar, please read through it, review it, make sure you feel comfortable with it. And what I wanted to highlight as a thing that will be coming up are things relating to polar coordinates. You're gonna see more of this next week. I have a whole series of lectures where I'm doing calculation of electric field by integration. <laughs> it goes through some of this. Um, and I guess the good news that I will have is that um, a lot of this detailed calculation stuff, we do um, avoid using them explicitly. But even though we are going to avoid it, Try, avoid trying to do complex calculation using this, I still want you to be familiar because um, because when you see a new situation and somehow if the tricks that we are teaching doesn't work, sometimes you do have to just fall back to this basic method. So I want you to be familiar. And here, let's see, is the next algebra of vectors? Okay, there's the, the algebra of vectors, which I think might be more useful uh, later on when you learn linear algebra, because a lot of this stuff applies to linear algebra as well, but, um, or the, the, you know, linear vector space and all that stuff. And what I want you to end with the reminder of is the reminder of product of vectors. In physics 4a, you learned um, two kinds of product. You learned what's called the scalar product or dot product more commonly, and you learn the vector product or what's more commonly called cross product. And you're gonna see both of those in this class. <laughs> in fact, you will see the dot product pretty soon 
think we um, bring that in as we talk about flux because the way we express a flux is a, as a dot product of electric field and area vector. Uh, more on that next week. And um, later on, you are going to see the cross product as well. The, um, yeah, we are getting to the cross product. <laughs> um, the first place where you will see the cross product in this class is where, as we talk about the magnetic force. And um, and uh, when we do, I will do more thorough review of cross product because it's a, cross product is one of those things in physics for a we tend to not spend a lot of time on, but it's something that whose understanding of which becomes more important in this class. So I'll uh, review them more thoroughly when we get to it. But as we are getting there, this is the place where you can review it for yourself. Uh, chapter two in University of Physics Volume One is where all this stuff is covered, and it's a really important fundamental stuff. And I think that's why we tend to assume that you have seen it, you understood it perfectly the first time with no trouble, and you are going to have it remembered forever. That's what we tend to assume. I know it's not, and to the extent that you know it's not, you know, review this chapter, please. Um, so yeah, so that's what I wanted to cover, talk about on Coulomb's law. That um, it, it's a um, law of electrostatics, and it's a kind of a place to remind you that oh, all that vector stuff from physics for a.